everybody. Welcome to a Wine Writers Wrap Up. And, you know, today uh, is, what is March 31st or whatever, and it is day whatever of quarantine. And I am tired of hearing about quarantine. I am tired of hearing about social distancing. I am all for it. I am hoping that it, we come out of this quickly, and I am hoping that everybody stays safe. But I needed to talk about something other than this. So I reached out and my wonderful wine writing friends uh, agreed to pop on today. And the rule is no quarantine, no COVID-19, no self-isolation, anything is allowed, okay? I wish I had a big horn because if you said it, I was like, ah, uh, it's a horn to you, okay? <laughs> All right, but uh, anyways, so today, instead of that, we are talking about magic. We are talking about magic in the wine world and about a unicorn wine. Is there such a thing? Should there be such a thing? Have we actually ever seen this illustrious, magical creature? And uh, so that is where we are going today. So if you guys can introduce yourselves for a little bit, tell people who you are, where you're coming from, and uh, we'll get into it. Who do you want to start with? Oh, Nicole, you're big for me, so go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Nicole Ruiz Hudson, and I blog at both the Nibbling Gypsy and the Songs Table. So at Nibbling Gypsy and at the Songs Table on um, on Instagram. Um, I also occasionally write for Wine Spectator. I do a wine pairing column there. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Drinking at home today. Okay. Maria. Hey, uh, I'm Maria from Wine and Cheese Friday. I'm joining you guys today from Costa Rica, and uh, I'm excited to talk wine. Let's do it. Yay, Michael. Uh, I'm Michael Kelly. Uh, I've got a website, uh, California Wines and Wineries. I also have a blog, California Wines and Wineries, uh, hosted uh uh, this year, this last year, uh, a Cab Franc uh, wine competition. Uh, somebody very near and dear to us won the uh, <laughs> professional judges award. Won't mention any names. Somebody can see somebody <laughs> smiling. They happened to win. And it was a blind tasting, and it was very interesting that that uh, she won the, from the professionals. Um, and do a variety of other things, a wine a wine judge at uh, local competitions when they're not being canceled, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Almost said something. Uh, and Deb. <laughs> I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I write under the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a wine blogger and writer. I'm a certified specialist of wine and a wine location specialist in port and champagne. I am author of a book called uh, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries, Visiting the Hudson Valley Wine Region. And I am co-owner of a restaurant in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, called Kitchen 330, which we are opening Friday for um, takeout and delivery. Am I, am I giving feedback? I'm hearing a whistle. Just bite through it. <laughs> OK. Um, and. Um, I'm co-owner, co-host co co with Lori on Wine for Bed Street. All right, awesome. And I am your host, Lori Budd. My husband, Michael, and I own the winery Dracina Wines in Paso Robles, which <laughs> might have won that particular competition of Camp Best Cal, uh, Cabernet Franc in California. Um, and we just have received uh, that wonderful email that said we got another 92 in wine enthusiasts for our classic Cabernet Franc. So thank you. So if you are into Cab Franc, we are where you should be. And you can find us at dracinawines.com. So everybody, how is everybody? Are people drinking? Right. Drinking. So, Taking a break. <laughs> so I, I switched, Nicole. Um, I went on to this. And I thought that since the topic, this is how my brain works, right? Since the topic is unicorn wine, that wine that, you know, we quite just can't quite get, um, you know, it's usually something of extreme high quality or something like that, but we'll get into that later. 
I went with, I opened up the wine cellar before, and I was like, holy cow, there's a 200, there's a 2015 rosé. <laughs> um, there is, a, a, yeah, nothing left in this wine, um, but that is what I am, uh, that's why I'm going with. Uh, and as you can see, the color has completely uh, been altered as, as, as it has oxidized and so has the flavor. But it's too late. I can't get up to go get another bottle. So this is what I will be drinking. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I'm sorry, did you have wine? Uh, yes. It's, um, it's natural springs uh, from uh, Mount Shasta area in <laughs> California. Uh, no, uh, we're having ha barbecue hamburgers tonight. Mm -hmm. And so I did not feel like I wanted to open a two fifty three hundred dollar bottle of wine for burgers, and uh, my wife had a similar uh, put the hands up no no so we're uh, we're gonna we're going with a simple simple wine tonight for dinner but I have wines that I will talk about later. Oh uh, okay, I just fell into two bottles now. We just do two bottles now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I guess I should shout out that Lori and I were on a chat earlier today, um, so I still have the bottle open from the Kuhlman Land, the Land Kuhlman Reserva to, wait, there we go, <laughs> 2011, and that's really nice. I think I'm, try, I'm trying to save that for, for dinner later. It, and I will say that was a beautiful wine, and... Uh, they had recommended opening for uh, an hour prior, and I listened, and as we were on the chat for the hour, it evolved. Um, by yeah. the end of the chat, it, wow. would, it would blow your mind. So, uh, Deb, you drinking? I, I am drinking. I have a 2016 Hudson Valley uh, Wine Region Millbrook uh, Cap Franc. Oh, the bottle's downstairs because... Paul's drinking it too. <laughs> so I, I got sent up to my office with a glass. There you go. And uh, Maria, what about you? Are you drinking? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Chilean Carmenere tonight. Um, <laughs> it's a wine I've tried before. Uh, and we opened it a day or two ago. We're actually wine rationing now because this is our last regular bottle of wine and we have a bottle of sparkling um so i have some to drink with you guys and a little bit more to drink with dinner and that's the end of it <laughs> oh no oh no oh we need a replenishing uh, run then um all right so thank you guys for joining i am so happy to uh see all your faces and uh hear your voices and um so I have a very, um, I guess, definitive opinion, although those of you who really know me know that's really not very strange to have a definitive opinion on anything, um, but about these unicorn wines. So my first question to you guys is, how would you define a unicorn wine? So, Michael, how would you define a unicorn wine? Well, uh, I guess the way I took took the topic, which I've never heard of unicorn wine up until oh. the broadcast, so that was an interesting phrase. Uh, but I assumed it's something that is rare, uh, very seldom seen, uh, if you kind of des describe a unicorn. Um, but you don't want to say mythical, but you very seldom seen, um, unique, and it's uh, kind of uh, prince, princely, uh, charming, Fairy tale like it's so good. Is that a reasonable description? <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful description. <laughs> Nicole, anything to add to that description? No, I think for having never heard of a of unicorn wine before, I think Michael got it like kind of hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Maria or Debbie, anything to add to? I to? have nothing to add because I didn't know what it was. So. You know, something unattainable, or it might be attainable in the right circle. Um, okay. Maria, had you heard of it before? Um, 
I had not heard of a unicorn wine either, um, so I actually just Googled it yesterday so I could see what it meant. Um, but I had guessed that it was something like unattainable or something that you had always strived for uh, to taste or something along those lines. Um, I also did want to add, uh, you heard some noises earlier. That is the bugs that are in the background right now. I decided to sit outside instead of inside because the lighting is usually so bad inside. I was trying it out to be different, but between my internet interference and the bugs, we'll see how long I can last. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. Oh, now I'm like, oh, bleh. Okay. <laughs> Um, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna say Nicole, why are we the only two who have heard of this? Because in my brain, this was like world known terminology. Yeah, yeah no, I I don't know, like I, I maybe I think it comes. It's like one of those Instagram hashtags. I don't know how. I feel like most of us are in, on Instagram, but it feels like that's one of those things that like some put on their wines all the, their bottle pictures all the time. So um, maybe maybe I've just been spending too much time on social media. <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe you and me both. Then yeah, I think so. Uh, because when I sent this out, I really I was like, oh, this is everybody's going to have a specific one in mind, you know, or whatever. Um, so it's interesting that we're the only two who had ever heard of that before. So um, maybe, maybe we're the cool kids. Cool kids on the block. <laughs> On the vineyard. Yes. So, Michael, you get you get the star because, as Nicole said, you like nailed it on its head. That's exactly um, a definition for it. So, with that being said, do you think that there really should be, or do you believe that there is a unicorn wine? Is there a unicorn wine for you? Is should it be a single entity? Everybody wants this wine. What do we think of that? Nicole? So, oh, Michael? Yeah, so, so boy, that's an interesting uh, question. So you, you look at it, and should there be a unicorn wine? I'm not sure there should be one because I think there, you're always evolving. You're always looking for perfection. You're always looking for the next best thing. You're always uh, – there's always a twist. There's a better season. There's a better weather. There's the great varietal – changes by location um, it's hard to say that there is just a single unicorn wine but I think we've all tasted a handful of the best wines we've ever had in which we had more in our cellar not oh, well absolutely yeah. true yes yeah. yes all right. Nicole what do you think yeah, I don't think there's just one, and I think it's probably different for everybody because, like, you know, there's so many different wine tastes out there, and I think depending on sort of, like, what wine crowd you're in, probably those crowds have different unicorns, <laughs> um, or maybe you have many, and I think um, I, I'd like to have, I'd like to have lots. <laughs> Maria, what about you? Um, well, I wasn't sure if I had ever had a unicorn wine or what my unicorn wine would have been. So I just started thinking about a wine that I had been really looking forward to trying at some point. Not that it was like the wine that everybody knows, but uh, like Nicole said, I was kind of just going to approach it from uh, what my, what my unicorn wine would have been. But I mean, I think that there's definitely wines out there that we're all striving to try at some point. Um, mm -hmm. And if we can define it that way, then it probably is something different for all of us. But I think there's something out there. Deb? I think, you know, I didn't know what unicorn wine was, and I actually asked you. And, and I did some thinking on it. And, you know, you you want to might want to say you know the screaming eagle the Utah rock child from you know years years by, but I think to me um, a unicorn wine is when you're 
you know, when you have that opportunity to taste something rare that you would never have that opportunity to taste, whether you're at a winery and they go into their their cellar and pull out a 1950-something wine or, you know, something special to them. I think that, to me, is, is a unicorn wine because that is something that I would not normally be able to taste mm -hmm. and that I'm privileged at that moment to be tasting. I think you're totally right with that. So yeah. that, that's my uh, thought process that's, on that. That's kind of how I think of um, a unicorn wine because I think if it's something that we've never had um, that is almost unattainable, so rare, I don't necessarily know that it's even there. In all, in all honesty, right, I don't. there's wines out there that I have no clue, and that's one of the things I love about our group of, of wine lovers is, you know, we post things, and I'm like, oh, my God, I've never even heard of that wine. Meanwhile, I read the comments, and everybody's like, oh, my God, that's the best thing, you know, and I'm like, okay, so that could be my unicorn because I had never even heard of that region before. Well, like well when, when you messaged me back and you said, like, Screaming Eagle. So I've had wines that Heidi Barrett has made under Lambert, and it's been great. Um, Dom Perignon, people like, oh, I, I just would love a Dom Perignon. I've had that recently when somebody paid off their mortgage. It wasn't me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> they celebrated and they brought over a Dom Perignon. So, you know, is that a unicorn wine to me? It's something, okay, I marked off my uh, right. checklist. But to me, it's, it's got it's something special. And when you, when you see... When that person is sharing that with you and you see that the love and the history and behind it, to me that's, mm -hmm. that's a unicorn. Yeah, it's, and I think there's other things too, just to like add on. It doesn't, it's not always about like it being a cult classic or whatever. It can be um, something that's cool and interesting for, yes. for any number of reasons. Like maybe it's something that um, is – has an unusual amount of age on it and you're getting to try it and from an from an interesting region or like or maybe it's a completely obscure region and that's right. why that's why it's interesting. Or maybe um, it was made experimentally. Right. Right. And it worked out well. Right. Could be. So I had mentioned Screaming Eagle to you, Deb, because that was some people define a unicorn from something that they can't afford. A wine that if they had X amount of money, they would buy this wine, and that would kind of be a screaming eagle for many people. Um, I, it, I mean, if somebody wanted to pour me screaming eagle, I'm obviously not going to say no, um, but it's not something that if I, you know, if I die before having a screaming eagle, that's going to be my regret of my life. Um, you know, but for others, the unicorn is, it has absolutely no dollar value. It's the you know, this is such a rare thing to go by. So what would you say is the rarest wine, or have you had something that you consider is the rarest or very rare wine? Uh, go ahead, anybody. Oh, my God. You know, I got, to, I got the memory loss thing going with the age. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had, I've been privileged to have a lot of, you know, really interesting wines. Um, so I really, you know, I can't say because, I mean, I've been in the cellars of Burgundy and, you know, small producers that they've pulled out some really wonderful things. I, I, I really can't say one thing over another. Okay. So I'll actually jump in a little. Um, I, so Back in the day, back when I worked like in the offices at, at Wine Spectator, I, I I was a coordinator, and I got to taste lots of different things. I got to taste a, like an amazing variety of wines, kind of all the time. And then on top of that, what like every year they have their um, uh, wine experience in uh, that travels around, um, so I get to go, and that's kind of odd because you have like so many unicorns 
in one place at one time that you're almost like rushing to taste them all and you almost can't absorb them, which is a, a whole different weird experience. But one that actually, that I'll, that like, I, I call it a synesthetic experience because it sort of was like more than just tasting. It was just, it just exploded in my mouth and created all different kinds of sensations was the um, crew of Clodum and Neal from like 1998 and 2000. Those, those, that, that's, um, those are two that still stand out in my mind as like as magic. See? See, I think, I think it doesn't have to be you know, well, I mean, well, that 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 kind of falls into all categories of you um, But like, it doesn't, it doesn't. I agree, Deb. It doesn't need to fall in line to is this wine a thousand dollars a bottle, you know, or plus, um, or is this, you know, they only made ten, you know, ten hundred, you know, ten or a thousand bottles of it, and you got one. Um, I think that it can be very different and. If it's a unicorn, it's supposed to be so brilliant and so amazing. So I would think a unicorn wine would do what Nicole was saying, is it just like burst out in all different, you know, um, memories. The, the, the whole price thing doesn't necessarily, um, I mean, in that case, that, that one, yes, it's super expensive. But there were plenty of other unicorn wines that I tasted during that time that were not, I mean, like they were good. Right. They were even really good, but they didn't. They didn't do that. They didn't do the magic, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. So Maria, any uh, unicorn wine memory? Um. Well, uh, the one that I was able to think of is a uh, Pinot Noir that I actually just had a few weeks back. Um. And it kind of goes more along the lines of what uh, Debbie was saying about having an experience with a loved one and just wanting to have a special wine. Um, and uh, the Pinot Noir that we tried, it was called Osio, um, and it's a Chilean uh, wine by a brand called Cono Sur. And it's one that I had been hearing about um, because I'm familiar with the brand. I've been hearing about it on and off for a few years, and it just kept making me want to try it more and more and more. And finally, I was able to find it uh, a few months back uh, here in Costa Rica. And um, and it goes along, again, too, with the price point that you were saying. It, it's a $100 bottle of wine, which we don't ever buy, but um, we were celebrating our 20-year anniversary this year. So... Um, so I think it checks a lot of those boxes. It was expensive. It was special. We celebrated with it. Um, so, I mean, I'd say that that was our unicorn wine uh, by that definition anyways. And um, it's actually what I'm writing about this week for my entry. Yeah. Is that a bug? Those are bugs? No. That's, that's like a monkey or something, no? That's like an animal. <laughs> She's staying oh, quiet and talking because something's going to attack her. Blink twice if you're okay. Maria? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's still breaking up. If you asked me something, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> we were worried about you. <laughs> we <laughs> we heard like an animal. We thought Bo Bigfoot was attacking you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but to, to bring it back to Maria, um, I actually had that wine um, in New York. I was at a Colangelo uh, marketing uh, Christmas party, and Commissar was there, and they they were pouring that wine. So as soon as I saw you posting that, I was so happy for you because it is it's a beautiful wine, and I do I think it does fall into a unicorn thing because. Like you don't see that normally. Like I had, I had never seen that label anywhere except at the at the Christmas party, and then you know you found it in Costa Rica. So, but I don't think it's a very well um, distributed bottle anyway. No. Yeah. The the thing that's crazy is I do um, like quarterly wine chats with Cono Sur, and everybody always would talk about the Ocio. 
from like people in Europe and people in wherever else. And I'm like, where is it? Like, how can I never find it? Like, I go into wine shops and I ask them, do you have OCO? And they say, no, like, we don't have it. And um, it was through one of the chats that I told them. I said, I'm in Costa Rica. Where can I find it? Like, can I find it somewhere? And they said, you have to go to San Jose, uh, which is the capital here. There's a shop that carries it, and that's where you can find it. Um, and so this year when we flew in to San Jose, I was like, okay, I'm going to find that shop. Like, I don't care where it is or what I have to do. I'm going to that shop to get that line. So, I mean, it was awesome, and it was an adventure, and then everybody there spoke Spanish. And, I mean, I do speak Spanish well, well enough to get through everything here. I mean, the people that we live near, they don't speak English, so all we do is speak Spanish. But I was like – gushing in Spanish, like, oh my God, I'm finally tasting the wine. I can't believe it. I'm so excited. And I was like, I didn't even know I knew those words in Spanish. So it was pretty cool. But um, yeah, I, I don't know where they hide that wine. It's definitely not one that you can find. Okay. So I kind of have a question in terms, again, with the unicorn wine, because it's not necessarily um, a price point wine, it has, you know, it has so much. Now, I'm, Maria, you bought that specifically for an event. But if you have a unicorn wine and then you finally find it, are you rushing home and opening it or are you coveting it in your, in your cellar? And then part B of that question is, is, I mean, I think my unicorn wine have always been at a tasting. So I haven't had the opportunity to actually have the bottle. But... So let's go with question one is if you actually obtain a unicorn wine bottle form, what do you do with it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would think that if we, did, if we didn't have a special occasion, then I would have found a way to wait to have it. And I mean, we did even wait like six weeks after we bought it because it wasn't the anniversary yet. Um, but as you guys know, with me, saving a bottle of wine is like the world's hardest thing because I don't live in one place. I live in a million different places, so I have no wine cellar. I just have to buy wine for the day or whatever for the moment, and that's it because I don't have anywhere to save it. So uh, I would have had to make up an occasion, I guess, since I found it. <laughs> Nicole, what about you? I do have a lot of things stored, um, both here and still in New York, actually. <laughs> but, um, but I'm thinking that if I'm, if for whatever reason I am forced to have a at-home birthday this year, I, I might actually purchase one of my unicorns um, and to have it home. Because why not? <laughs> would open it for your birthday. Yeah, so I guess both is the answer. <laughs> but where in New York is your cellar? Because I'll go, like, take anything out of it for you. Yeah. We, we, can, we, can, we can help you with that cellar. And yeah. <laughs> so, Michael, what about you? If, you? if you finally obtained a unicorn wine of yours, are you uh, – Coveting it, or are you popping that bad boy? Um, well, a little bit of both, actually. And mm -hmm. so over the years, and obviously doing this for a long time, I have found some unicorn wines. And um, one was had won the 1981 Best Cabernet of the World in 1981. Mm -hmm. And I bought this in 82 yeah. from a broker. And I had six bottles of it. And at that time, I, I can't remember. It was probably ridiculously expensive, 150 back in 82. And so I kept that. And we opened a bottle, thought it was wonderful. And that was a uh, 77 Sasakaya. Okay. And then we, but at that time, we were having, a lot of people were having kids. And so when they had their first kid, I would bring a bottle of that to the hospital. Uh -huh. and give that to their birth of their first child. And it was a very nice 
bottle of wine. So that's where you kind of share it for those occasions, okay? Um, so, but we were, we were literally in um, Italy a, a couple of trips ago, and we found this, a bottle of the 77 Sasakaya in this village of 162 people up in the middle of nowhere in Tuscany. And I said, gee, I said, oh, I've got to get that bottle because I've since gotten rid of all those bottles. And I said, I would like, to. so there was my unicorn wine sitting in this dusty metal cabinet. And I said, I need, I need to buy that bottle. And the guy says, so a little old Italian guy comes out and he says, well, he says, I, I sell it to you. He says, 350 euros. And I said, nah, that's okay. That's all right. You know, so, so, so it had a, that wine is a unicorn wine, but I wouldn't just buy it for any. Okay. I wouldn't go over the, over the top to buy it again. Okay. Do you have anything about that? Would you well, or pop it? I've, I've experienced things getting lost in the wine cellar. And then when we went to open it, it, not that good. It's past the teeth. <laughs> yeah, some really, really good stuff. So I'm at, at the point, and probably maybe even the stage of my life. It's you know, if it's good, okay, maybe I'll wait a year or two, but nothing more, because otherwise it's just going to get lost. When is a good time? Are you saving it for that special occasion? Is that special occasion ever going to come? Right. Maybe. Maybe not. So drink it and enjoy it with the friends that you want to enjoy it with. And that will know that will appreciate it as much as you do. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Yeah, so that, that's my feeling of it. So if this unicorn wine, if we actually purchase it, okay, we find this wine and we purchase it, not the fact that unicorn necessarily means uh, dollar value, but I was watching a show, you know, because, um, what is it, really horrible show, I know, but I love it, Supernatural, and in it, they were talking about some artwork, and the person said, uh, should we authenticate it, and they were like, nah, they think it's authentic, so it's all good to go, so... If you have a unicorn wine and it is one of those wines that's that mystery label, that whatever, would you want to have it authenticated before you pulled the trigger? I think if I was going to pay that kind of money for a wine, then I can't see that happening. <laughs> then yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, but I think. Most of most of the wines that I purchase are are just from the winery at the time, or just came out, mm -hmm. and then and so I'm a little different than Debbie. I hold my wines about ten years before I drink them, a minimum of ten years before I drink them. So the, the good stuff. I mean, we have everyday wine too, but the the stuff that's really in the cellar and collecting dust, th those 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 wines are meant and you know, at some point, to your point, Debbie, at, you know, you, you want to enjoy them. And so if we have some friends over we haven't seen for a while and we're having a nice steak, we're going to open up a nice, you know, nice bottle or two for something like that. Um, but but I still always keep wines aging and, and maturing and changing and evolving because I think that some of these things will be phenomenal down the road. But if, if your unicorn is is something that's already aged that's what, you know that's what I'm saying it's already aged are you uh, and you purchase it are you like oh my god I finally have this I can't drink it you, you know or are you like oh my god I finally have this the minute I get home I'm popping it doing whatever you know decanting or whatever I need to do to it um, and drinking it so I guess I guess my question is, are you um, you know partying that you got it, or are you you know holding it in and secretly enjoying that you have it? 
you know, Col- you, do you guys know Colin McPhail? He used to, uh, he runs a consulting business in Calistoga, California, but he used to be with Larkmead. And uh, he wrote an article oh, a year or so ago about the worst people are collectors. If they're just collecting to be collecting, that you want to collect but to enjoy and have occasions to drink that wine, not just to put your arms around it and, and hold it uh, hold it tight forever. Uh, you've got to be able to to enjoy it to that time that it gets to its full maturity, but absolutely drink it and enjoy it and enjoy it with mm-hmm. friends. Okay. Anybody else? Cool. No, I agree. I think, um, like, I mean, I I have things that I'm holding, but my intention is to drink them someday, and maybe I need to create more occasions. But I'm, but I'm kind of always trying to come up with, you know, I, I try to create the occasions. Right. Um, but I, but there are very, I mean, to be honest, there are very few wines that at I just don't see myself paying the money, even if I had it, unless I was just, you know, won the lottery. I, I just don't see myself paying the crazy, crazy prices that for for a bottle that would need authenticity. Like, okay. I can, need the authenticity. So, yeah. I have to agree with you because that money can be used so much in a different way in family life. I mean, okay. right, okay. and and. You know, and, unless I had that discretionary income. Yeah, like I could, like maybe, maybe a few hundred dollars. But it's like something that's like crazy, crazy thousands of dollars. I, you know, there's just very few that I've had that I'm like, yeah, I'd pay for this. <laughs> that's always that's always our second question. You know, just Mike and myself. You know, when we're tasting wine, when we're out or whatever. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, this, this wine is great. Or, you know, I'll be at an event where I'm tasting more of these potential unicorns, and I'll come home, and I'll say to Mike, oh, my God, I had this wine before. He, and he'll say, well, how much was it? And I'll say, like, okay, now what would you pay for it? Um, so I, it, it does make – that that price does make a difference, it, you know. Um, I think I just spent the most amount I've ever spent on a bottle – uh, because uh, it, we, Mike and I got married in 1995, and so we're coming up on a big anniversary, and I, wa- I wanted a 1995 wine. I wanted a 1995 Bordeaux. Um, so it's more, I'm telling him it's a gift for him. <laughs> but, but that's, you know, that's probably the most amount I, I have ever spent on a wine, and we're not talking thousands of dollars at all. Um, so I I don't know. I just, I think the unicorn wines for me go back to, like Debbie started, it's an experience. It's something that not necessarily is something I'm going to buy. And I think yeah, everybody's I, unicorn wine is different, and and I for everybody, it, it is different, but I don't think it's about price. I think it's experience. I mean, because you're, you're not going to experience this, you know, it might be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It might be something somebody's sharing with you that's an older vintage or an experiment. I just think that that's what you have to, to hold. You know, and have the wings and fly. <laughs> <laughs> I will throw in that there's also like there are wines that are maybe unicorns for me that I that just they're unicorns because they've just eluded me. Like I just haven't like the occasion, even through tastings, even through um, all the wonderful experiences we get to be a part of. Um, I just haven't had the chance to try them, and they're sort of. They've been on my radar for a very long time, so I feel like there's there's the the personal unicorns that just seem to slip our grasp. Like that's a that's a like for me for for me some of those are like the the sell off champagnes. I've never had one, so like it, and it's not because I don't know about them, and not because I'm not super interested. It's just like 
just had some quick happens. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I think I t mentioned I had been up tasting at a private event up in Napa, and this guy came out with a new wine that was five thousand dollars, so it beat Screaming Eagle by three three x the price of Screaming Eagle, and he did it just because he wanted to, you know, pat his you know pat his chest saying I make the most expensive wine in Napa Valley at five thousand a bottle, and it was it was nothing. I mean it was it was like a it, I have all kinds of wines between 150 and 300 dollars that would beat that every day of the week, and it's just to me that, and because again there was some whole story with his whole ego and everything that that wine had no appeal to me because of the winemaker and the owner mm -hmm. and his attitude about the wine, whereas there's other wines that Melka or um, uh, that are reasonably priced wines, reasonably mm -hmm. priced wines meaning nice, you know, the, in that yep. 175 to $300 kind of range uh, that are really good wines, and those are wines that, that have a better appeal to me and will still age and still are age-worthy to continue on. Um, and those those are for special occasions like to Debbie or, or Lori for anniversaries or for uh, New Year's Eve, we always pull out a nice bottle for New Year's Eve. We do these types of things uh, for birthdays, etc. But not tonight for burgers. For tonight for burgers, we're gonna, you know, we'll pop something. I mean, I mean, the average price in the cellar is not is is still three digits. So it's not like they're cheap wines in there, you know. So it's, but we'll pull out something that is, you know, a thirty forty dollar bottle. We're not pulling out a Melka. <laughs> what? We're not pulling out a Melka. I'm not pulling out a Melka tonight for burgers. No, no, I'm not going to go there. And I have a lot of his wines. And so we I did very too. Purpose, we, we purposely collected a lot of, we follow winemakers over the years. Mm -hmm. And we have got a lot of different winemakers that we have followed over the years. But I'm not opening anything like that. We're going to open a very nice wine. But not, it's an everyday wine as opposed to something that's over the top. Okay. Actually, now, we'll get, no, sorry, just, just as a footnote, whenever we're, we're not supposed to talk about tonight ends, we are going to open a nice bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to come to your house and we're going to sit in your cellar while you open that bottle. <laughs> okay, you're welcome to. Uh, Nicole, what were you going to say? That um, a couple of years ago, I want to say, um, I read an article by Eric Asimov that was like, I think it was called like in praise of like in praise of the everyday wine, something like this. And and I really thought that was a lovely sentiment because I mean we talked a good big game about all these like all these fancy bottles that we've had the pleasure to drink, but honestly my everyday bottle is it's still in that fifteen to twenty five dollar category. And um and I think because of that you end up creating more memories with some of these wines that make it into like a rotation um, because they're just there. They're, they're a part of your everyday life. They kind of become a little bit more of the fabric in a nice way. Right. So. I agree with that. I agree with that. Well, I mean, I think that I don't technically have a house wine. I know so many people, you know, they buy a wine by like the case and that's what they always have. I tend to have wineries that would be my go-to you know I, but um i i i get that um the one of the wines i truly like is a uh, garnacha and it is the stupidest label on the face of the earth and i'm like kind of embarrassed that i enjoy this wine because of that label um but it is a 1099 bottle of garnacha and I, I will go to that left and right, and every time I go to and the wine shop. You need to be shop, embarrassed about it. No, the the label is what I need to be embarrassed about. Well, because, you know what? Some of the wines my go to, you know, everyday things that I really like, they're inexpensive wines. Yeah. They're they're like fifteen dollars and less. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes also you have to take note. You know, you might get you know try a bottle of a expensive wine, you know, say 
50, whatever is expensive to you, 50, a hundred dollars. And it might not be what you really thought it would be where your $10 bottle of wine outweighed it. So you really, you know, you have to take that into consideration and, you know, Absolutely yeah. agree. Where the unicorn falls. Right. And for different reasons. Different reasons. Yep. Yeah. And, and for a different reason, you know, in the wine cellar, there's a lit row of display bottles, you know, that go around the, the cellar right. that are lit up. And there's, you know, just 58, let's see, 58 and 11, 69 bottles that are lined up around the cellar that are lit up. And there's then it's just stacks up, up and below and above but of the wines I can tell you that there's a $30 Chardonnay that sits on that display shelf and there's $300 bottles of wine that sit on the display shelf but the $30 bottle of wine that sits on the display shelf is a very good friend who's in the wine business and we met her 20 plus years ago and we have uh, formed a relationship and so I want to display her wine it has nothing, and so <clears throat> it's not the cost of the wine, it's the, it's the sentiment that goes behind it. Excellent. Yeah. All right, guys, any I, final words on what you think of a unicorn, uh, unicorn wine? Anything before we get to our wonderful riddle? I think we need to enjoy it wherever, whatever your unicorn wine is and wherever you are enjoying it, whoever uncorks it for you, enjoy it and savor the moment. Very good. All good? Are we ready for our thinking caps? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. So I have been on a run of watching one of my favorite movies of uh, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So... This is actually from Lord of the Rings. Well, technically The Hobbit. But here we go. Ready? What has roots as nobody sees? It's taller than trees. Up, up, up it goes, but it never grows. I'm in New Zealand, but I never read The Hobbit. Uh, this is... This is this is when um, he's talking to Gollum. These are this is one of the riddles that Gollum tells him to uh, have to solve so he doesn't die. So it's not it's not an easy one, but I got I got I got sucked into the rabbit hole there of, of Lord of the Rings. So here here it is again. What has roots as nobody sees? It's taller than trees. Up, up it goes, but it never grows. And as a hint, I'll say the root thing is, I don't think it should have been a legal riddle for Gollum. And, uh, what is a grapevine? <laughs> has nothing, I will tell you, it has nothing to do with, well, I can't say it has nothing to do with wine, but it kind of, you know, it doesn't directly have anything to do with wine. I feel like it really it doesn't technically have roots in terms of what people think about, but you just can't see the bottom of it. I guess I'm out of the competition tonight, you guys, for the riddle, because I definitely didn't hear enough of it to know what the question was. Okay. So what has roots as nobody sees? Although I'm telling you roots is a bad word, people don't think about it in terms of roots. It's taller than trees. Up, up, up it goes, but it never grows. The, the sky? Galaxy? Mm -hmm. Stars? You're not, <laughs> you're kind of, well, you started off on the right track, but whoo, <laughs> I diverted. All right, it's a mountain. Uh, it's a mountain, right? So it does have roots. It, it, it's, you know, down there it's not, you know, it's got roots, but you don't see it. It's definitely taller than every tree. You look at it, it goes up, 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 but, you know, it doesn't grow. Oh, no, wait a minute now. So I was they in think, high tech. Michael, they think, Michael, they don't grow unless there's an earthquake. Nope. 
No, <laughs> so, so I was in I was in high tech GPS for years, and the, we actually measured the uh, Mount Everest. And Mount Everest is actually growing at about a quarter of an inch per year. Is it the growing, tectonic, or is the tectonic plate pushing the, the it tectonic's up? The tectonic pushing it up, yes. Well, there is not growing there. <laughs> well, it's getting taller. <laughs> but you're not increasing matter. I'm going to go biology here. <laughs> biology outrules geology. <laughs> yeah, well, no. <laughs> All right, guys, so we're at the point where you're going to give one minute goodbye to everybody, tell them where to find you on the social. So, Michael, why don't you go first? Uh, Michael Kelly, um, HTTPS, California Wines and Wineries, um, and uh, the blog is on Facebook, California Wines and Wineries, and uh, uh, I'm in Facebook jail right now. Uh, for another till April 4th, but after that I get reprieved and maybe I'll be back on on that. But I'm still publishing on my own uh, some other things, but I'm not publishing all the sites because I can't post. Hmm. Long story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, Debbie. I'm Debbie Giaquindo. You can find me at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com. I'm HV Wine Goddess on Twitter, HV Wine Goddess on Instagram, Hudson Valley Wine Goddess on uh, Facebook, and you can find Lori and I on WineForBitStreet.com. And Maria? Hey, hey, everybody. This is Maria trying to hear everything on the chat. Um, we're uh, I'm Wine and Cheese Friday, and you can find me on most of the networks that at Wine Cheese Fry, F-R-I, for Friday. Awesome. And Nicole? And I am at nibblinggypsy.com and songstable.com. Uh, Nibbling Gypsy is uh, that, just across all platforms. And then um, the Psalms Table on, on Instagram. And again, I am your host, Lori, and I can be found on all of the socials for the winery at, at Dracina Wine, and the blog and podcast are at Exploring the Wine Glass, except on Twitter, because that's way too many letters for it, so it's just Explore the Wine Glass, uh, Explore Wine Glass without um, the E in Explore. So thank you guys for joining, and I am so happy to see your faces, and I hope that you uh, continue to drink well. All right, so uh, thank you for everything. Cheers. And my glass is empty, but I still cheers to you guys. Okay. So long, so we'll See you again. Cheers. See you again. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Okay.